Chapter 13. If he dies, you get charged with attempted murder. Ramik, 11th grade. You need to quit hanging with those thugs you run with, Ramik's mother said for the hundredth time. You're going to end up in jail just like your daddy. But those are my boys, Ramik replied defensively. They always got my back. They're going to end up putting your back in prison or a cemetery, his mother asserted. Ramik knew his mother was right, but his allegiance to his friends in the Plainfield neighborhood was too strong for even a mother to break up. It was just plain hard for Ramik, trying to figure out how to become a man in a place where manhood is measured differently than the way your mother sees it. I'll be back in a couple hours, Ramik said as he grabbed his black trench coat. It was the day before Thanksgiving, and the house was filled with the pleasant smells of turkey gravy and apple pie. But he was a little angry that she kept at him for things over which he had no control. He left the house then and headed down the street. The day was chilly and blustery. He ended up where he always hung out, on the back steps of the closed and dreary Clinton Elementary School, sitting with his friends, sharing a 40-ounce bottle of old English malt liquor. They had no particular plan or purpose. Yo, man... Look at that crackhead heading this way. It makes me sick the way they be hanging around all the time, Remix said with disgust as the man, skinny and very high, stumbled toward them. Didn't he used to be a lifeguard down at the swimming pool? A dude named Train asked. Yeah, man, but crack don't care who you are or who you used to be, Remix replied. The crack addict, with matted hair, red, glassy eyes, and filthy clothes, said in a thin, raspy voice, Let me cop a rock off y'all. Ramik and his friends tried to ignore him, but the junkie would not give up. Come on now, I know one of y'all can hook a brother up. Train, who actually had some crack to sell, told the addict, I'll sell it to you, ma'am, but you can't smoke it here, got that? Ramik knew what he meant. There was a generally understood rule in the neighborhood that the school grounds were off-limits for drugs. Little kids hung out there. And Ramik and his friends felt like they were protecting the younger generation, even if it meant just in this one small area. It was a matter of pride, a code of honor, an unwritten law of the streets. The crackhead nodded shakily, gave Train the money, and stumbled away. A few minutes later, Ramik looked up and saw the orange and blue glare of a crack pipe blazing from behind a dumpster in the schoolyard. I told him not to do that mess around here, Train said angrily. I ought to go beat his butt. As if on cue, Ramik, Train, and the other boys put down their bottles and walked over to the dumpster. Train yelled at the crackhead. I thought I told you, man, you don't be smoking that stuff around here. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the trembling crackhead replied, cowering from Train's anger. So raise up on out of here. We want you out of here now, Train insisted. Get out of here. Hold on, just let me finish, the addict said weakly. He put his lips around the crack pipe and inhaled deeply. His eyes were still closed when Train punched him. The attic fell to his knees. Liquor and adrenaline took over. Ramik and his friends began beating the man. You dropped him, man, one of them shouted as he hit the helpless attic. Let's knock his lights out, useless crackhead, yelled another. The man stumbled back to his feet. Somebody else hit him again and knocked him back down. He moaned, writhing in pain on the ground. Ramik and his friends were out of control. Ramik lifted the man up not to help him, but so he'd be a better target. They hit him again and again. For 15 or 20 minutes, they beat the man until he could barely move. Their anger at the man made no sense, but somehow he represented all the drugs, the death, and all the sorrow they saw on the streets every day, and their pent-up rage exploded all over the man's body. Suddenly, Ramik reached into his pocket of his trench coat and pulled out a small switchblade. Check this out, he said with bravado as he waved the knife in the air. The looks of awe and admiration on the faces of his friends encouraged him, but Ramik was suddenly afraid. Afraid to use the knife and afraid not to use it. He jabbed the man in the thigh, hoping inwardly that he had not really injured him. He slipped the knife back into his pocket, trying to appear as cool as the look on the faces of his friends as they admired his courage. They left the man lying on the sidewalk, bruised and bleeding. Calmly, they walked to the store, bought three candy bars, then sauntered back to the parking lot of the school. It didn't occur to Ramik that anyone would care about the beaten drug drug addict until they heard the siren of a police car. He was genuinely surprised. What are we going to do? Ramik asked. Should we run? Just play it cool, Train said. They ain't got nothing on us. 
A police officer approached them. Ramik's heart thudded, but he pretended to look bored. We got a report that some dudes who fit your description beat up someone pretty bad, he said. It wasn't us, Ramik told him. The man who got beat up said one of you was wearing a black trench coat and had a knife, the officer said. Ramik felt his knees go weak. The policeman made him stand up and patted him down. He missed the knife. Ramik gave a sigh of relief. Then a second officer said, Let me pat this one down again. I ain't got no knife, Ramik yelled. Your buddy already checked me out. The policeman ignored him. You better not be lying to me, boy. I ain't lying, Ramik was trembling with fear. Slowly and carefully, the second officer frisked Ramik. He whispered in his ear, If I find a knife, I'm going to hurt you. He found the knife. I told you not to lie to me, the officer said angrily. He threw Ramik against the police car, then kneed him in the stomach. Ramik groaned in pain and anger and fear as he was handcuffed. The crack addict, who was being wheeled away into an ambulance by now, looked up and identified Ramik, Train, and the others as the ones who assaulted him. Ramik and his friends were tossed into the back of a police car and taken down to the station. Ramik, who just a couple of hours ago had had left a home full of the soothing smells of Thanksgiving dinner, was stuck in the back of a police car that smelled vaguely of sweat, urine, and disinfectant. That crackhead you beat up is critically injured, a policeman told them when they arrived at the station. He may die. Ramik shuddered in fear. What does that mean? He managed to ask. The policeman didn't blink an eye. If he dies, you get charged with attempted murder. Oh, my God, Ramik whispered to himself. Please don't let this man die. You want to call your mother, the officer asked. Ramik nodded, called his mother, and tried to explain to her what had happened. We didn't mean to hurt him. We just got carried away, he said to her. He knew it sounded weak. Well, why don't you just think about that for a while, his mother snapped back. You're not going to come get me, he asked. No, I'm not. You sit there for a while and see what jail is really like. Maybe this will teach you a lesson. She hung up the phone. Ramik was taken in handcuffs to a detention center in a nearby town. His mother, who decided at the last minute to come and rescue him, got there too late. Since it was a holiday weekend, Ramik would be forced to stay in jail until Monday. He was placed in a cell with two other boys he didn't know. The cell consisted of a toilet and two cots, both of which were occupied so the officer told him to sleep on the floor. On Thanksgiving morning, instead of waking up in his own bed to the smells of Thanksgiving and the sound of football games and parades, Ramik woke stiffly on the cold, concrete floor of a jail cell. He spent four days in that detention center. He ate terrible food, endured embarrassment and humiliation as he used the toilet in front of his cellmates, and even heard late one night the horrifying but unmistakable sounds of a boy being raped. Ramik felt like a caged animal. Some of the boys in the jail had been there many times. Many seemed to accept jail as part of their life, as in their inevitable future. But Ramik bristled at the thought. Never again, he told himself. I'm not going to waste my life this way. When he was released, he was at first ashamed to tell George and Samson what had happened. The three of them talked about football games and girls and applying to Seton Hall as if the world were unchanged. But Ramik's fear of what might happen to his future shaded everything. In January, he attended a hearing before a judge. Several teachers and family members had written letters on his behalf, asking for mercy. The crack addict did not show up, however, so the case was continued. A second hearing was held. Once again, the addict didn't show up. A third hearing was set. Ramik, dressed in his suit and tie, waited for the worst to happen. But again, the man they attacked didn't appear in court. The judge finally threw out the case, and after several stern warnings from all involved, Ramik was allowed to go home. Thank you, God, Ramik whispered. He felt as if he had been racing blindfold to the edge of cliff and had been grabbed and saved just as he was about to descend into a pit from which there was no escape. He swore he tried to stay out of trouble, to hang with Samson and George more, aim for higher goals. For a while, it worked. Waping, waking up in jail was a surreal experience. That first morning, I honestly thought I was having a bad dream. When I opened my eyes and realized I wasn't dreaming, I was terrified. 
I'd gotten myself into a big mess and it was horrible. I'd almost taken the life of another human being. How could I have been so heartless and cruel? That experience taught me so much. I learned up close all about the horrible things that happen to people in jail. Beatings, stabbings, rapes. The next thing I learned took me by surprise. I realized I wasn't free. I looked out the window and saw all the people going about their daily lives and realized I wasn't able to do that. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't go to the store. And I couldn't get a bite to eat at the local takeout. All I had were stale milk and processed turkey for that Thanksgiving meal. I had given up on my chance to make choices and freely decide what I wanted to do each day. It was stifling. Finally, I came to a realization while I was in that jail that changed my life forever. When I looked around at everyone there with me, I realized none of them was thinking about freedom or choices or even the bad food. They were resigned to this life, as if that was how life was supposed to be. They had no goals, no future outside of those jail walls. That disgusted me the most. With all of that, I prayed to God and asked for forgiveness. I told him that if he got me out of this mess, I would never be back again. And I never was. It took me some time to get my act all the way together, but after that experience, I was well on my way.